Neanderthal, man of the forest. Perhaps not the first thing you think of when you think of the Neanderthal. Yet recent evidence suggests that the Neanderthal was not the stoic ice man that we've come to believe, but instead an ambushing woodland apex predator. The Neanderthal sprint gene is a gene that has raised questions about exactly what influenced the genetic makeup, the physical makeup of the Neanderthal. Fascinatingly, I was actually given this gene from both my mother and my father after doing a recent DNA test, so to speak, I figured this out. It's actually fascinating because when I was growing up, it was kind of my thing when I was a child to be the fast kid. I was known for being the fastest one, the fastest bike rider, and I've always had decent legs. And that's the only redeeming physical quality that I have. But my point is, what does the Neanderthal sprint gene tell us about the physical makeup of the Neanderthal. In this video, I'm going to go over the Neanderthal as a man of the forest, not a man of the tundra or the snow or the mammoth prairies. I'm going to explain the physical characteristics of the Neanderthal, their location, and we're going to explore exactly how this Neanderthal sprinting gene can help us unlock exactly who the Neanderthal, what the Neanderthal really was. Neanderthals had a physical appearance that wouldn't be too different from a modern-day northern or northwestern European. So what were the physical characteristics of a Neanderthal that really stand out to us and are significantly different from modern Homo sapiens? So Neanderthals had a far broader nose, a longer skull, generally larger than humans by the way, and a larger brain, a face that tended to project outwards, much more similar to our cousins, the chimpanzee, than it would be to Homo sapiens an occipital bun, interestingly enough, I also have this, so I've gotten quite a lot from Neanderthals it seems, a pronounced brow ridge, a broader, more robust, and just generally stronger build than your average human, shorter legs due to a shorter tibia and fibula, which is fascinating to me because that is the part of your leg that would have your calf muscles, right? That is shorter on the Neanderthal, but they did have thicker bones as well. They had a higher pitched voice though, which is something you probably wouldn't associate with all of the different traits I just mentioned. A much higher pitched voice on average than a human would. All of these traits sort of come together to make them human but also not human at the same time. But the question remains, why do they have these traits? What did these traits give them that could be evolutionarily advantageous to some varying degree for the environment that the Neanderthal lived in? The broad nose of the Neanderthal has often, including by myself, been associated with uh, the European general triangular shaped nose. All humans have a more protruding nose compared to any of our human-like ancestors, a great example being our cousins, the chimpanzee, and how they just essentially have two open holes. All humans, no matter what race, have a pronounced nose to some degree, but some of us have it far more pronounced than others. Some of us have nostrils that point straight down, others have them that point more upwards depending on the shape of your nose. Theories say that part of the reason for the general European-esque nose that is triangular has been to survive in a colder climate, as air would be less abrasive when passing through the nasal canal, making it easier for you to breathe in a cold climate. Now while this does hold true for the more pinched triangular nose shape that we do see in Eurasian people, specifically Europeans, it does not make any logical sense for the broad nose of the Neanderthal, as it's not shaped the same, it's only been associated with it because we associate the Neanderthal with Europeans. Neanderthals had incredibly broad noses, much more akin to African individuals than it would be to a European. The only difference was that their noses were large. That's what makes it fundamentally different. Their noses were incredibly big, not in the same sense as a European, but in a completely different and more unique sense, something that you do not see in modern human populations. Some of the theories that have been going around for what the broad nose may have been for, if it doesn't seem to be scientifically proven that it was helpful for a cold climate, is that it would actually help them breathe more, because they had generally more robust and stronger builds, as I said, and they would need more oxygen to pump into their body in order to power their muscles, which of course they had far more of. Personally, when I watch fights, I've recognized very quickly that the more muscular you are, the quicker you wear out, and that's why we get things like Tyson Fury versus Wilder, where Wilder is clearly a more superior physical specimen. If you want to put it down to scientific terms, the man is completely jacked, cut, and incredibly tall. But Tyson Fury, while less muscle-defined, is 
well, first of all, he was a better fighter, but he didn't tire. And one thing I noticed about so-called out of shape fighters is that it seems to be that the more muscular fighters run out of breath far quicker than the less muscular fighters. And so more muscular fighters have to rely on knocking somebody out early to win, whereas somebody like Tyson Fury can go every single round until the end, and he will knock you out because he'll wear you out, but he can also just win off decision due to the fact that he's just never going to tire. So I think what we're literally seeing here is that humans are very much at a disadvantage when we become muscular. Our bodies were not meant to be muscular. In fact, our bodies were meant to be the literal opposite. We have lost muscle to an extreme for the sole purpose of being able to expend as little energy physically as possible and put as much of that energy as physically possible, so to speak, to our brains. So perhaps what we're seeing with the Neanderthal nose is a literal adaptation to being a more muscular, stronger human that also needed to maintain maintain and upkeep the muscle. All of this actually comes together to support the idea that Neanderthals were most likely forest dwelling ambush predators. Group ambush predators. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating because humans are not the same. We can do similar things, but fundamentally speaking, humans hunt through sheer attrition. Even nowadays, if you see a hunter, they sit and they wait in one spot, sometimes for multiple, multiple hours, and then they just kill the animal that they're hunting, or they outsmart it. They know where it's going to be, they know where it's going to land at certain locations at certain times, and then they kill it. But very, very rarely do you go hunting with your spear or your melee weapon and you literally run up to the giant boar and you impale that that doesn't happen often okay science shows that neanderthals probably did something similar albeit more often probably in groups than they would solo all the time so in this regard we could say that their broad noses were entirely disadvantageous for a cold climate and probably helped them to alter to some varying degree during the multiple different ice ages that they lived through this would actually make perfect sense because what we're ultimately going to get to is as the last ice age that we experience is at its height humans are beginning to migrate out of africa the Neanderthal is on its last leg, and we've been trying to figure out why. Attributing some of their physical characteristics to being disadvantageous to an Ice Age climate seems to make the most sense in this regard. Now, a longer skull is actually fascinating because this does not necessarily make them more intelligent than humans, although there really is no evidence to suggest that they weren't at least as intelligent as humans to begin with. Generally speaking, a larger brain does indicate a more intelligent creature, but there are exceptions to the rule. People have used the fact that there are exceptions to the rule to argue that a large brain has no indication of intelligence than the creature, but of course that can't possibly be right. Most intelligent creatures on the planet today have a large brain, and the only exceptions are more archaic forms of creatures like birds, which could be related to some of the oldest creatures that have ever existed on this planet, which are dinosaurs, and they have smaller brains, but they have more neurons and everything is more closely packed in, and so they're able to compute more, to do more with their brain than you would assume with a smaller brain. However, birds also have a chance of literally burning up and just dropping dead due to overuse, the same way your computer might overheat if you run it too much. So, these are important things to keep in mind. Evidence would technically suggest that the Neanderthal was at the very bare minimum just as intelligent as we were. Now, their face projecting outwards obviously has to do with a genetic lineage that is more ape-like, chimpanzee-esque like, just to give uh, a modern reference, a living reference, rather than human-like. So it's important to keep in mind that most apes have a face shape like this, and humans did for the longest time. Some of us today have a far more protruding face than others, and it's perfectly normal. It just happens to be that due to a variety of different factors, some of which could be as simple as sexual preference, right? I mean, it could be anything, have ultimately led to humans having generally flatter faces than our cousins from the past. But as far as we know, the last common ancestor between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals was Homo heidelbergensis, which, if that is the case, would make perfect sense as to the more archaic look of the Neanderthal. The occipital bun is particularly fascinating as it's something that Neanderthals generally did have and something that humans generally don't. As I mentioned, I actually do have one and in my family, everybody was always curious as to what it was. My grandfather quite literally used to call me a knothead when I was a kid because when he would like rub my head, he would feel this weird bump on the back and he genuinely had no idea why I would possibly have that. I also didn't know and it was fascinating when I learned later on that it's actually some form of genetic carryover from a Neanderthal lineage. 
or perhaps even more ancient human lineage. Now, an occipital bun is essentially a bump on the back of your head, and it's a prominent bump, or a projection, of what they call the occipital bone at the back of the skull. It's most often found in males, by the way, and it seems to have some connection to the brain. One of the most prominent theories today attributes the occipital bun to an enlargement of the cerebellum, uh, the visual cortex and secondary visual cortex of the brain. And this is absolutely fascinating because it would imply that the occipital cortex is giving some kind of advantage to the individuals that have it. Now, the visual cortex of the brain is the area of the cerebral cortex that processes visual information. So essentially, sensory input originates from your eyes, and then it reaches the visual cortex. Now, the primary visual cortex is apparently the most studied visual area in the brain, and it is highly specialized for processing information about static and moving objects, and apparently is excellent in pattern recognition. So the general association of the occipital bun based on recent studies, current studies, is that it has something to do with improving the efficiency of the brain. And so to some varying degree, I guess I'm very happy that I have it. Now, a pronounced brow ridge is more of evolutionary backwash than anything. Very few modern humans have it today. None of us have it today to any extreme that a Neanderthal might. Now, a prominent brow ridge is useful for a variety of reasons. It was also possibly a way for Neanderthals to signify strength, similar to antlers on a deer. And at the same time, it's believed it may have actually helped a Neanderthal chew tougher meat, meaning they would have a stronger jaw than we do. Now, what a brow ridge does not give you is more expression, something that not having a brow ridge does and something that humans obviously capitalized on. So one of the major pitfalls here seems to be a lack of expression or communication to the same degree that humans may have had. Now, I do think that if you envision the Neanderthal as a man of the forest, somebody that would be trying to traverse the dense woodlands of Eurasia and trying to hunt red deer or uh, just other big game of the time, that a broader and more robust build that is built for sprinting seems to be the optimal way to do things. However, what I think is the most important thing to keep in mind here is how disadvantageous this build would be for a cold climate. Now, in a colder climate, it would make more sense for an animal to be better at maintaining their stamina, at having more endurance. Something that Homo sapiens, interestingly enough, had from their savanna environment in Africa, and it happened to carry over into northern climates and become evolutionarily advantageous in those environments as well. Meaning modern humans may have just been more versatile and more adaptable. It's also incredibly important to keep in mind the certain mythos that comes with an ancient forest people from all over Eurasia as well as North America that is often purported to be cannibalistic and have red hair. This is a very common myth, although again, it is myth. What's important to keep in mind is that the Neanderthal was purported to also have red hair. And studies actually show Neanderthals were cannibals. Now, to what degree, as in how often they did it, how often did they do it simply because they were suffering and desperate? And then you have to ask yourself, well, how often were they desperate? And to what degree was it just normal? With all those questions in mind, one thing we can say for certain is that they did it. That we have bones to this day from some of the very few bones we've even found of the species that maintain cut marks that show that they were processed and the marrow was extracted by their own kind. What does that say about the forest ambushing predator? Could it have been that when the temperature began to drop, the Neanderthal was suffering, was desperate, and was clinging on, barely surviving, only to have to engage in cannibalism to push through? Could it have been that the Neanderthal realized that when times were tough, the only thing that mattered was your group, and so they cannibalized rival groups, and it was part of their regular culture that then extended into the human mythos, as perhaps they attempted it on our ancient ancestors as well. It's hard to say, but what we can say is that the fact that they cannibalized each other at all, whether it was for some kind of ritual purpose, or because it was an act of war or aggression towards a rival tribe or individuals within their tribe, it's still amazing that they did it at all. It was kind of a luck of the draw type of thing. 
Homo sapiens happened to adapt to a climate where the traits that we adapted were more applicable to different environments, whereas it looks like the Neanderthal hyper-adapted to an environment that, in particular, was damning for them when it changed to a colder version of itself. This is perhaps the most intriguing part of this entire hypothesis, because it would change the way we look at Neanderthals uh, just ever so slightly, removing them entirely from the equation of being a snow human, so to speak. So on the topic of genetics, let's talk about the Neanderthal sprinting gene that shows the Neanderthal as less human-like and more sprinty ambush predator-esque, which again is fundamentally not human. But even more so, we do not often associate Neanderthals with being quick, with being sprinters, nor do we often associate humans with hunting in a style like this. Most of our studies of the past say that humans essentially ran animals off of cliffs, that we tired animals out by chasing them so long that they eventually ran out of energy because of our extreme endurance. And that eventually we acquired ranged projectile weapons such as the rock or the spear, the javelin, and then later on the bow and arrow, and that we were able to essentially by that use our intelligence to take down animals without actually having to get up close and personal. The Neanderthal is the complete opposite of this in literally every way. It seems seems that the Neanderthal, from what we know, had absolutely no understanding of the bow and arrow. Although, to some degree, we believe they threw their spears, we do know that based on taking Olympic spear throwers and having them throw a recreation of a Neanderthal spear, that it is doable, although very difficult. Although, it's important to keep in mind that with the strength and build of the Neanderthal, it perhaps was more easy for them than it would be for a modern human to do. But since evidence generally says that the Neanderthal had very little to do with the projectile weapon, and since now evidence points towards them being sprinters and perhaps forest ambushers, maybe it is truly the case that Neanderthals were much more likely to run at their target and attempt to spear it down rather than playing a long game the way that Homo sapiens do. And this in and of itself would have been absolutely damning for their entire race when the Ice Age came. Neanderthal skeletons are often found fractured and broken in very bizarre ways that imply that they are constantly in contact with large wild animals that are most likely fighting for their lives to some varying degree. What this implies is that with their sprinting, melee-based, ambush style of combat, that when an Ice Age occurred and they were relegated to larger game that was far more powerful than your typical red deer might be, they were probably injured quite often because that was their way of locomotion, that was their way of hunting, they didn't know any other way of doing things. They were perhaps too specialized in what they were supposed to be doing, and because their environment was constantly changing over hundreds of thousands of years, they suffered for it in a way that Homo sapiens did not. If anything, it just seems to be that the Homo sapien lineage was generally more versatile than the Neanderthal. We were less specialized to some degree, but that was better. And I think overall, when we assess all of the different physical traits of the Neanderthal, we do need to keep in mind that we don't know everything. Once upon a time, just 100 years ago, the Neanderthal was thought to be a literal monkey in that regard, in terms of general intelligence, um, in terms of general respect from scientists. Slowly it morphed into this stoic ice man that uh, was incredibly intelligent due to its literal ability to survive and adapt to a cold climate. But now it's becoming more and more clear that perhaps the Neanderthal was simply a man of the forest, a woodland ambusher, a meat eater, incredibly quick, incredibly fast, incredibly strong, incredibly robust, but not incredibly versatile. And perhaps their physical adaptations were a bit too specialized. So before we continue, let's outline some of the things that I've named so far that you would have to think if you were going to go with this Neanderthal as a man of the forest, a woodland ambusher hypothesis, rather than the more traditional one that is currently thought in the mainstream. So number one, you'd have to think that Neanderthals hunted in a way that was uniquely different from humans. You'd have to think Neanderthals evolved in a warm Middle Eastern climate first, before migrating to colder climates, and before they were hit with any form of Ice Age environment that would fundamentally alter their gene pool. You'd have to believe that Neanderthals attacked animals in melee range 
far more often than by range, and you'd have to think that Neanderthals evolved its stocky build not for a cold climate, and by extension of that to conserve heat, uh, but for a warmer Middle Eastern climate, not as abrasive as the African climates they may have come from originally, but still a climate that was warm nonetheless, and they would adapt to dissipate heat. So ultimately, and I hate to say it, but what we're essentially saying here is that ultimately humans were biologically superior to Neanderthals, not more intelligent, but literally biologically superior to Neanderthals for the climate that Neanderthals happened to be in around the time that humans began migrating. Again, it's just a hypothesis and you don't have to think that way, but evidence, in my opinion, seems to push me in that direction. It is possible that only some of the things that I think are true and mixed with some of the things that other people think could be the real answer. But that's the point. We don't know. Now, Neanderthal behavioral adaptations are fascinating because in most cases it's just conjecture. However, there are still some very fascinating things to keep in mind. The Neanderthal was 100% capable of creating clothes. So you have to think, chimpanzees aren't out in the forests or the jungles of Africa with sewing needles made out of bone sewing hides together to create clothes. That is fundamentally highly intelligent. With that being said, they were also capable of making stone-tipped spears. Again, I can't even make a stone-tipped spear. How did a Neanderthal do it? They must have been very intelligent. Denisovans have been seen to have created jewelry, and by extension of that, the Neanderthal would have been capable of doing it as well, as the jewelry was found at sites where we have actually found hybrid Neanderthal and Denisovan humans. Neanderthals seemed to be migratory, and they would go from place to place hunting various different animals. One theory is that during these migrations, Neanderthal tribes would meet with other tribes, and they would coalesce, come together to hunt big game. On top of that, we also believe they would have also exchanged women in order to keep the flow of the gene pool going. And lastly, something I really think people overlook is most of the time when people talk about Neanderthals, they just happen to forget about like the first couple hundred thousand years that they existed, and they just speed all the way up to like the last 100,000 years that they existed. And the last 100,000 years of a Neanderthal's existence as a race was fundamentally, inherently, in every way different from the original Neanderthals who first entered the Middle East and Europe and Eurasia as a whole. The idea of a lumbering oaf uh, comes from skeletons of the earliest Neanderthals, the newer idea of a more intelligent, stoic, and misbegotten Neanderthal race is a much more modern concept based on much more modern Neanderthal skeletons. Could it be that it's far more complicated than this? Obviously, if they are as intelligent as we are, if they are human, it must be the case that just as we are, the whole story must be far more complex. What if it's not that the Neanderthal was not a practitioner of early projectile weapons, but that the specific type of projectile weapon, that perhaps technological innovation, just as it is today, was the main benefactor in the rise of man? The Schoningen Spears, named aptly after where they were found in present-day Germany, are Neanderthal Spears that unlock a little bit about how they hunted. And it supports not just the forest ambushing archetype, but it supports it in a slightly different and more unique and complex way. Now, the Schoningen Spears were made using trunks of slow-growing spruce trees. However, Spear 4 was made from pine. Now, the spears in general ranged from 6 to 8 and a half feet, and they had diameters ranging from 29 to 47 millimeters, or essentially 1 to 2 inches. Now, Perhaps the most interesting thing about the spears is, again, the complexity of their creation. Something that at first glance we may not have attributed to what happens to be 300,000 year old Neanderthal spears. Now the spears have evidence of being worked on both ends, and specifically they are tapered on both ends and possess a point as well, making them double pointed. So as I mentioned earlier, we had Olympians throw recreations of the Neanderthal spears found, specifically the double pointed tapered spears, and they were able to throw them at a distance of 15 to 20 meters. Now while this is nothing compared to how a human can throw a spear today, which by the way could potentially unlock a little bit about if it wasn't a different invention, it could also have been just being better at throwing the spear itself, but but even if that's not the case, and the Neanderthal could have thrown the spear farther than 15 to 20 meters, or even if 
15 to 20 meters was all they could do, it is still more than enough to hunt with, especially when you account for the vast strength of the Neanderthal. Now, a couple things that are important to keep in mind here is number one, they use different kinds of trees to make different kinds of spears. Um, number two, it seems like it was even more impressive in the sense that they understood that the base of the tree was going to give you harder wood. And so they were designed the spear in a way as to maximize the hardness of the wood. And you really have to think about 300,000 year old Neanderthals and they are perfectly cognitively aware of how to do this. In my opinion, the mere creation of these complex spears is enough to justify extreme intelligence of what is either early Neanderthals or very similarly, a late, late version of Homo heidelbergensis. But what if it's not just that humans could have been making better spears or been more capable throwers, but perhaps something far more technologically innovative that could have propelled humanity forward and given humanity an advantage over Neanderthals that the Neanderthal would have never expected. This brings me to the topic of the bow and arrow. Q humans finally figuring out that if they made tiny versions of spears and then they took some kind of elastic material and connected it to one of their wooden shafts that they had lying around their camp that they could essentially shoot the spears with far greater force and it would also amount to a more accurate shot, a more consistent shot, far quicker shot, and a much farther distance. Now, bow and arrow technology was found outside of Africa, so in Neanderthal range, as far back as 45,000 years ago in Sri Lanka. Now, what's interesting about this is Sri Lanka is so deep into what would have been standard human migrations for the time, in that humans had been migrating in this general area for tens of thousands of years prior to when the bow and arrow was found here, that it's actually quite plausible that the bow and arrow arrived far before this date, but we simply don't have any remains, or haven't found any remains, that made it to the modern day. All we know is that roughly 70,000 to 100,000 years ago, humans started coming in and Neanderthals were on their way out. Could it be that the bow and arrow was ultimately what wiped out the Neanderthals? Not necessarily only in the sense of possible aggression between Homo sapiens and the Neanderthal, but perhaps just as a hunting tool and a way of maintaining your territory. Now, Neanderthals have no proof of using the bow and arrow at any of their sites, but they certainly were, as we've described, capable of not just using spears, but throwing spears. Ultimately, if you have a bunch of archers against a bunch of javelin throwers, you will win as the archers 9 out of every 10 times, with the one time simply being a time in which perhaps you were able to close the distance so that you couldn't just outrange the spear throwers to begin with, or out shoot them because you'd be more accurate. So as humans were migrating out of Africa with their bows and arrows, it's not very surprising to think that they may have actually used them against Neanderthals. In actuality, this would have been equally as damning as when Europeans discovered the New World and found people with the bow and arrow who now had to fight against European gunpowder and steel. It's very important to keep in mind that humans on every continent possess knowledge of how to use the bow and arrow. It doesn't matter where they are, whether you're in a place in Africa where there's an uncontacted tribe, or in South America with the same concept, or in South India, or Southeast Asia, whether it's in Europe, or China, or North America, everybody, even Australia, all of us know how to use the bow and arrow. This means that to some degree, Throughout the entirety of the migrations, we must have had access to the bow and arrow. Because again, humans that would not have had almost any contact with anybody that would have had the bow and arrow before them have a bow and arrow. So again, it could be that humans outcompeted Neanderthals due to better spears and better technique. It also could have been that the bow and arrow itself was the ultimate deciding technological factor in this waning competition with 
the Neanderthals, a species that perhaps was heavily adapted for its woodland forest environment that were capable of throwing spears and thrusting spears and ambushing their prey both from a short distance and from melee range, but were not capable of competing with a bow and arrow that could shoot from an absolutely ridiculous range for far less effort and to far deadlier effect by the newly migrating Homo sapiens into their territory, who also happened to be far better adapted to the environment that they didn't even evolve in. One that perhaps had been tormenting the Neanderthal species for the last 300,000 years. An environment that was only good for them some of the time, but they were incredibly proficient when they were within it, but was subject to consistent change, to colder temperatures that ultimately were not advantageous for the Neanderthal as a whole. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video on the Neanderthal. I really, really love this idea, this theory that they are a forest people because it makes them one of the most unique types of human to ever exist. Woodland ambushing predators, all very fascinating. If you enjoyed the video and you wanna see more videos like this one, make sure to subscribe, like the video if you enjoyed it, but I'll see you in the next one. Have a good day.